I'll start us off if you're if you're open to it. We'll just kind of get going. Let's go. Yeah, uh, Matthew Hussey. Wow, this is cool. I've been following you for a few years, and I remember just before kind of I had my time taken off on TikTok and Instagram and stuff, following and and just being like, whoa, it'd be so cool to get to talk to him one day because in the world of like relationship coaches and relationship gurus, there's a lot of chatter and a lot of noise, but you <laughs> kind of stand out as like this really grounded and wise and like thoughtful voice in this space in a way that, I mean, not to insult the space or anything, but just it, it was uncharacteristic to find just uh, someone with your, I don't know, just, there's a calmness and a patience in letting people work through the, the many facets that can be difficult around finding love and relationships. There wasn't, I, I guess the way I've characterized my experience of your work is like he's not trying to rush to give quick answers and just to say the most viral kind of like bumper sticker type thing. Um, he's actually seems like he's in the long haul kind of rhythm with folks of like, let's do some of the personal work. Let's kind of hedge our expectations. Let's try to come near the other person as more than just kind of a fantasy or kind of a check mark. Let's try to get to know them on a deep level. It seems like you're trying to bring people deeper on their path to finding love and relationship rather than it just being a solution. Um, I don't know. How does that strike you as I describe that? Uh -huh. That was lovely. It's really lovely. I, I, I appreciate it. I, I'm a, a fan of your work and, uh, uh, you know, I really respect the way that you go about your work. I, you know, I think we, we share some, some DNA in the way we approach these things. And mm. uh, yeah. it's, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't think there are always simple answers and I, I, you know, I think it's, um, I would, I'm like the worst live TV guest in the world. I feel like, because I just, <laughs> I'm, so? I'm the person they get frustrated with because I don't have short answers. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. I, I, I feel like I'm never great for this just sound by element. And I always frustrate people with, you know, hearing a question and then wanting to talk for the next 30 minutes about everything that brings up and mm -hmm. that doesn't lend what well, hasn't historically lent itself to you know when i started out 17 years ago it was all about tv and sound bites yeah, and yeah. and then you know luckily podcasts came along and you got to actually talk mm -hmm. for longer with people the same way you know a therapy or a coaching session would take place where you actually get to sit with someone and dig deep into what's going on and not kind of patronize people or be reductive with an answer that's not actually nuanced for their situation. So I, uh, I really appreciate it. And I, that's, that's exactly the kind of energy that I've brought to this new book. It's the kind of energy that mm -hmm. I try and bring to everything I'm doing these days mm -hmm. is really figuring out what's, what's going on. It's not, you know, we, I think it's funny because but for my entire career, what I got known for was helping people find love and mm -hmm. being a kind of co-pilot for them on that journey. And for a long time, I think we were sort of gaslit by technology companies to think that like, the only problem is just, we're not meeting each other. And if we mm -hmm. could just solve that, and if we could just create some apps <laughs> so that yeah. we could meet each other more easily, that would, that would fix our love lives. And yeah. of course we've, discovered that's not true and for several reasons it feels harder than ever to find love we feel like we're in a kind of culture right now in dating that that feels really uh both naturally difficult and also uniquely difficult right now i think and that's that's people's real experience is that wow i really deeply want to find love it's one of the biggest goals i have for my life and and there's a lot of fear out there and there's a lot of anxiety out there uh, uh, from people who feel like, wow, it's not working. I'm not finding my person. I'm not where I thought I would be by this point in my life. Uh, I, I don't feel the way I thought I'd feel by this mm -hmm. point in my life. Yeah. And for a while we, th we feel like dating or finding, you know, the process of how we find love these days is broken. And, and then the more and more of our friends we see get into relationships, the more we start to worry that we're the one who's broken. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really, I, I wanted this piece of work, this book to be something that addressed the real emotions that people feel when they're on that path to finding love and the real obstacles they feel without just 
giving people cliches like it'll happen when you least expect it without yeah. telling them they just need to get out there more. Um, yeah. Some of the low hanging of an fruit. Or- it almost kind of yeah. feels uh, like yeah, kicking sure. someone when they're down. Yeah, For sure, yeah. Uh, you know, and then... So I, I, all of that, it worries me for people because I want, I want people to not just find the peace and the happiness that can come from finding the right relationship. I also want people to experience more peace and more joy on the way there because I think yeah, life is too yeah. short to defer that to a time when we, we finally meet the person mm-hmm. we, we feel we've been looking for. You know, I, I love that you start the book in that way too. The book Love Life, uh, it's coming out soon. I'm, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it to get into the world. It's, um, you start the book by talking about singleness. And this is, uh, it's just an interesting topic. A little bit about my backstory and just how I relate to this was I actually got married super early. So my wife and I, we got married 19 and 20. And that was a little bit endemic of like, we grew up in kind of conservative Christian Bible school world. And so we kind of just left right from high school into a conservative Bible school. It was pretty, like the, the joke was ring by spring. You know, everyone kind of got engaged freshman year and then, and then uh, you know, linked up and went on their way. And most of those marriages have split up by now. Uh, that's the sad reality of just looking on Facebook at old friends that I think when you're impulsive in that moment, um, you don't always make the most maybe value grounded decisions on who you link up with. But it was it was interesting kind of, I was we were always the married friends in the singles friend group. Um, just by virtue of us getting married really young. And I think it was it was fascinating just to see the the difference in our lives because I think like, for example, Paige and I really focused a lot on career in our 20s and school um, because we kind of had that, I don't know, that aspect of trying to find the one, so to speak, kind of like already in place. And I just watched so many of my friends go through these high highs and low lows and then just the mental fatigue of the breakup and just the emotional trauma. Like it was just, just people wrecked for weeks, you know, when they really thought that they found somebody and then it just, uh, for whatever reason, fell apart. And it doesn't just bring up the disappointment with that person. It's like, what's wrong with me? You know, is just like you stated and like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm never gonna find this again. And then what's interesting now is so many of my friends uh, it's the first round of like divorces, right? Among, amongst my friend group, kind of where I'm in my early thirties right now. And so there's lots of folks through 28, 29, 30, kind of going through that first divorce and then re-entering back into dating and wondering like, again, is something just wrong with me? Is something just, and, and the thing that kind of started to hit me, maybe even just in this past year was like, man, I think we think of singleness in this culture as like a disease or like, like, like it, it's pathologized. It's, this awful thing that needs to be cured and almost all of our energy, so much of our financial energy, our attention is on curing this disease of singleness so that we can finally be happy. And then on this current just viewpoint on my life story so far, it's like, well, my marriage has been deeply meaningful and has not been the sole thing that's like accomplished my happiness permanently. (laughs) Like, like Paige makes me very happy, but there's so much of my life that is not about my romantic relationship. And there's so many people where I'm watching those marriages kind of fall apart and they kind of fall back into that idea of like, oh, I got to get into the next relationship. So I guess all that to summarize a question would be, why do you think we hold singleness in such disrepute? And why is it this disease that needs to be cured? And what is, is there anything positive in that season outside of just weight that we can say that's meaningful? Wow. I mean, there, I have no doubt, is a historical context that, you know, I, is beyond my expertise for where that deep sense of um, sort of social uh, stigma comes from mm. of the idea of being single. And I think that more even in a what what is a much more liberal, gen, generally liberal culture these days and a far less right. conservative one, I, I think those hangovers don't go away so yeah. quickly and yeah. there is still okay. the stigma of being unpaired and have having never found your person uh i still don't think has there been a president a sitting president that's ever been single i don't think so not that i know of yeah you know so it's it's uh you know i think there's still that sense of it's not just is there something wrong with me 
if I'm still single, there's the way that people look at others is, is there's something wrong with you that you're still mm. single. And we feel that judgment. We feel it even at our own loving dinner table at Thanksgiving where, you know, grandma or auntie asks you if you've met anyone yet. And there's a slight tone to the question. Um, we sense it. And, and, and of course, that's, a, that's coming from the outside. I think what confuses things is that there's also a very real, in, there's a very real internal feeling that we have that even if there was no societal pressure to find someone as some kind of marker for success, there's still the internal yearning for connection. Yeah, and, that's right. And, and that would be there even without the, the stigma. It would, we would still have this, what feels to many like an absence at the heart of life when we go, I, I have hobbies, I have friends, mm -hmm. I have things I enjoy doing, I, you know, I'm happy to go and see a movie on my own once in a while or to take myself to dinner. I, I, you know, I do all of the things that people tell me to do as a single person who needs to learn to enjoy it. And, mm -hmm. And I have fulfillment in my career and yet, you know, it's Friday evening and 8 p.m. rolls around and I've seen my friends three nights this week and God, what I would love right now is to curl up with someone who understands me, who is with me romantically, who I can say I'm building a future with. We, we don't think of building a future with our friends. We mm -hmm. think of having them in our future. Um, uh, with a partner, we think of this thing we'd like to build with someone. And, and, it, and it is an intensely sad thing for so many. I had a, a, a woman that I coached who said to me, this was her first question to me when we met. She said, how do I kill the desire to meet someone, to find love? Mm, she wow. didn't say, how, how can you help me find love? She said, how can I kill the desire to find love? Can you help me? She said, because I have wanted it for so long, it still hasn't happened in my life. And if I hold on to this desire and I never find that person, I'm gonna be sad for the rest of my life. Hmm. So how do I lose the desire to meet someone? That, who, who could hear that and not have their heart break for someone having arrived at that point. And this wasn't someone in their thirties. This was a woman I was coaching must've been, I, I'm not sure in her, the sixties, but it's, that's the kind of pain that we are dealing with. And there's a lot of shame out there from people who want to find love, but feel like it's somehow shameful to admit that they really want to find love. That's uh, right. Yep. Which is, uh, incredible really when we all know it's like a it's like a, the worst kept secret in the world that all of us want to find love deeply but mm -hmm. we're afraid of saying I really you know what I'd love in my life I'd love to f meet someone I'd love to find love oh dating apps those are f things my friends are on I I, mm -hmm. I you know I don't do the apps which is a kind of there's a, even in that when a little I bit of a that pride a lot, there <laughs> yeah. there's a yeah there, and there's a pride and there's a little bit of a like a judgment of like, look at them over there trying so hard ah. as if, as if trying to find love is a, is something to be ashamed of as opposed to something to be proud of that there's a vulnerable act that you are wow. seeking love, that you want to find love. And so, so much of my work focuses around a helping people understand firstly that you are not, there's firstly, you're not broken. Mm -hmm. There is no shame in being single. There's mm -hmm. also no shame in wanting love, in yeah. wanting to find love. And that there really are things that we can do and ways of approaching this going forward that can change our whole perspective on it, that can help us find love faster and can also help us enjoy it more along the way. Our past in this area, doesn't matter what age you are, does not have to equal the future. Mm, so well said. I love that it's the both. It's not pathologizing singleness. It's also not pathologizing 
um, wanting to find love and connection. I don't, I was thinking when you said that, like, oh, how do I kill this desire to find someone? I'm like, I don't even know if that's possible. I don't know if it's possible to, because we all need to be seen. We all need that companionship, like whether that's romantic or not. And I think for, to be honest, most of us really desire that within a romantic context, you know? And so I think one of the cheap answers that I hear is folks like, oh, well, you know, just find more friends, find connection in other ways, find it in other places. And it's like, yeah, there's some vulnerable depths that you really only uncover in a romantic partnership that, um, that would be inappropriate to find in other ways. And it's okay to yeah, there's desire some, there's that. Some, there is something a little disingenuous about those responses uh, because yeah, I, yeah. I, I feel that the people saying them are saying something that I, I would argue they probably haven't achieved themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's or, right, yeah. Or, or they're <laughs> yeah. saying it within the safe confines of a relationship and mm -hmm. ha have forgotten what it is to be in that situation and to, yeah. to, to and, and, and look, the other side of that is people uh, people want deep connection they also yearn for the the their sexuality to be expressed and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the current culture of hooking up doesn't necessarily work for them it's not it may not be something that they want and and so that that leaves a lot of people stuck in a kind of limbo because mm. it, you know i don't want to put th this sexual part of me is something I don't want to put on hold indefinitely, but I also don't vibe with the idea of, you know, just going out and having a string of casual hookups until I meet the right person. Yeah. Uh, and right. by the way, not everything is a casual hookup, but what's, what's the in-between? Well, the in-between is someone who you kind of know isn't right, but it's not quite casual. You're seeing them and at some point, you, you know, you keep going deeper and deeper with someone who ultimately you don't think you'll end up with. And the more times you sleep with them and the more times you hang out, and the the more you're going down this path that ultimately isn't going to work and is going to end up in tremendous heartbreak on one side or both. So it's, I don't think a lot of the time people discuss the practicalities of mm. being single and wanting to express love, wanting to express intimacy, wanting to like put, having this energy that you want to put somewhere and yeah. you don't have any a home for that energy that's an incredibly uh, it, uh, chronically painful and dissatisfying and unfulfilling experience to be having mm. you know i think the same tension and this is a little outside the context of, of dating but i see the same tension in the desire to have kids i think some people are like i have this energy and this desire to want to have a family and to have you know, <laughs> and that's one of their main reasons for wanting to find a romantic relationship and wanting to date. I mean, find the companionship with a, with a, you know, a husband or wife or whatever, but I really want to be a mom or I want to be a dad and I want to have kids. And that's actually the primary, you know, reason for wanting to pursue that. And I think the, the strange, seemingly parad paradoxical answer to this conundrum is something like, it's not like you can't be happy without it. In, in the sense of like, you have to have it or you're really doomed to be like really unhappy or hey, you can totally be fine without it and you can just, you know, find that companionship in other places. It's something more like, it's probably gonna be different for everyone. And if you follow the yearning in your heart and where it's guiding you, there's probably something there that's gonna scare you and something there that's gonna beckon you to take another step towards what's meant for you. Yeah, there's, and, um, yeah. The, the final chapter of this book is, called happy enough <laughs> yeah 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 cool yeah and and it's very very intentional language on my part i um i for for years i struggled with chronic physical pain uh which was a combination of tinnitus uh I had ringing in my ears that never went away still there um and i also had physical um, all sorts of ear pain and pain in my head and dizziness and a whole kind of cacophony of of wow. symptoms that for seven or eight years just plagued my life uh, to, to the point where it was actually the, the very reason I started therapy was because I got to the point of going I don't I do not know what I'm going to do about this I have tried every treatment I've flown all over the world I have thrown money at this nothing has worked and 
I don't know what I'm going to do because this takes me out of every waking moment of my life. I, and everyone can relate to that feeling of, God, life, even in the good moments, I'm not there. I am on the outside of my own life all the time. And, um, and it was truly a very, very dark place for me. And I said a version of what that woman said to me about her love life. I said a version of that to this therapist. I, I sat down and I said, I've made a decision. And he said, what's that? I said, I, I think I'm going to live for everyone else now. I, I'm going to live for my family. I'm going to live for my team. I'm going to live for my friends. I'm going to live for the people that I get to help through my work. But I think I'm, I'm going to live through f for, for everyone else because I'm, for as long as this pain is in my life, I, I'm never going to be happy. I'm never going to experience joy again. And I can't, I, I don't know what to do about that other than to find meaning in helping other people. And it was the darkest statement of my life. Um, and I, in the years that followed, I had to figure out what are the tools for me that can help me manage my relationship with this thing? Because if I don't get some tools, I don't know what, I, I don't know how I get through this for another 50 years. Yeah. Um, and those tools became, I ended up putting them in the book for anyone who's going through any kind of pain, be it physical or emotional, because that chronic pain that I felt physically that I didn't know how I was going to manage is the same, has the same components and the same, mm. there's a kind of similar mechanics to what happens to people emotionally in chronic pain. And I knew that if what my goal became, let me get to happy enough. It, if I can get to happy enough, I can learn to be okay with my circumstances the way they are now and mm -hmm. not wish for something else. Because for me, it was the wishing for something else that was killing me. It was the idea that with every doctor's appointment, that was going to be the moment where I suddenly started to feel better. And when, and, and so I would get the same way someone gets excited about a hopeful first date. I would get excited, you know, being like, this is, this is a turning point. I'd tell my friends, you know, I, I'm going to this treatment. I feel really good about it. I think this is going to be the thing that helps me. And then when it didn't, I would crash into a depression in a harder way than before. And mm -hmm. that was the cycle I stayed on for a very long time. And, uh, and I, and, and the, the tools that I developed that, or I n not developed myself, but I started to just everywhere I could yeah. find them. I started to bring in the things that were the most helpful to me during that time. Those became the, the tools that I talk about in the book for people to get to happy enough while they are in their current circumstances, which isn't the same thing as uh not wanting for something else you you mentioned a very important example which is people who want children i have for 17 years of my life now been, had a front row seat to the people who and women especially who want children so badly it is a life goal of theirs and it feels like it's essential to their being and and when and this isn't all women but the so many of the women i've coached are in that place and when it feels like where they are isn't on the trajectory for that to happen in time for their own biology the panic that sets in the anxiety that sets in leads people to some disastrous decisions decisions that have compounding effects for the pain That's right. in their life That's and right. so it's it's been a huge uh, it, I'm so passionate about that particular area that I wrote an entire chapter in this book called The Question of Having a Child, ah, where yeah. it's not only my experience of working with people, but I bring in fertility, some of the top fertility experts to talk about what they've seen in this area. But the what can help people is to figure out what their plan A is and then to get really clear on, well, what is plan B? in that area if plan a is that i meet someone by a certain time in my life and this happens 
the, the so much of the anxiety we feel is when plan A is the only plan we've told ourselves that we can mm. be happy with. And then mm. it suddenly we feel like we're a prisoner to that plan. And what I help people do is find out, well, what, look, what is, what is the plan B if this doesn't happen with another person on the time frame that you're looking for? What's, and then what's your plan C? And what's mm. your plan D? And at any point you can decide and it does, it's not for me or anyone else to tell people what plan B should be. That's a personal decision for everybody. But for some people, plan B is I'm going to have a child on my own. For other people, plan B is adoption. For other, There are different avenues for different people, and that's up to them to decide. But one of the greatest things we can do in life is be ready at any time to turn plan B into the new plan A and to mm. resolve to make plan B so beautiful that it's almost like you, you can't now imagine plan A having happened because plan B is so exquisitely beautiful in what you've made of it. Uh, but I think that, you know, a big part of this book is about having hard conversations. One of the hardest conversations we have to have is with ourselves that if life doesn't turn out the way that I had hoped, what's my plan B that becomes the new plan A? And how do I make that more beautiful than I ever could have imagined and, and, mm -hmm. and that's something you can do when you get to happy enough you get your power back again you mm -hmm. it, life isn't perfect but you get your power back and when you have your power back you suddenly ha you have the resources to start turning plan b into a new and beautiful plan a beautiful and i love your emphasis on um doing that intentionally I, I was just thinking as you were talking about all the women that I've worked with. Um, I used to work a lot with foster kids. So the majority at, at the beginning of my career was like all foster kids. And the majority of the parents were single women who um, maybe in their 40s, you know, late 40s, who uh, didn't, you know, find a partner or had recently left a partner. And so they decided, you know, that they were going to express their desire to have kids in adoption. And some of them premeditated that and kind of planned through that. And some of them, it was like an impulsive thing. And the difference was really striking, even in just how they held it. Because the, the interesting thing about what happened for the mothers as I was walking with them, like, let's take an example. You adopt someone maybe a bit impulsively. They have, like, just high acuity needs, meaning maybe they went through a lot of trauma. Maybe they have special needs. Maybe they're, you know, the type of kid that wakes up in the middle of the night and uh, you're up every two hours. And so, and then you're trying to hold down a full-time job and provide for this kid, but you feel overwhelmed. And it's there's a lot of shame in feeling like even almost a little bit of regret in, uh, in the adoption process. And how are you supposed to do that? Because this kid's defenseless. So why would I, you know, regret, you know, a decision like that? And then the catastrophe really compounds because it's like, oh, I tried to fulfill this dream and it turns out it's something that's making me miserable and I must be such a pathetic piece of garbage, like that I'm just destined for misery. And the, the arc of that, I mean, that, what, what a complex problem to hold, to hold. Like the, the arc of kind of coming back around is like, I think that all of us here on this earth are meant to live these different lives and to relate to these meaningful things in different ways. And when we can, when we can hold the grief of our plan A not coming to fruition in the way that we hoped, and then have a gentle, warm presence towards plan B. We have a mindfulness to approach it in a way that's actually going to lead to some beneficial flourishing. And even if you went with the plan B, like I'm describing in an impulsive way, let's say that you adopted, or maybe you even ha decided to have a kid. Now you're working full time and you have childcare and you're overwhelmed. You're not stuck. Like you're never stuck. I, I think, I think of people even who married someone impulsively that was just like, Oh, I just got to get married. And, and then they're with someone and they're like, Oh crap. Now I'm trapped in this terrible marriage. You're not stuck either. It's like, you know, there's, you're not stuck in a plan A that didn't go the way you wanted. You're not stuck in a plan B because there's a way, there's a, there's a how, there's an engagement, even within a really complex situation where you can, I don't know, how do I describe this point? It's like the thing that's making it hard is the thing that's making it meaningful. And what I mean by that is like the reason uh, being single is hard is because relationship matters to you. The reason parenting is hard is because your dream of getting to uh, to connect with a child and and pass on what you know and even just like watch them grow up like all of that matters there's a dream in the background that matters even in all the suffering 
And if you try to push against the suffering and be like, I'm gonna try to make the part of me that desires that meaningful thing just die, then you're actually cut off from the thing that gives your life meaning. And so there has to be a way to get close to the thing that's meaningful, even though it's painful. And uh, I don't know, what's coming up in your mind as I'm exploring that? No, it's beautifully said. I, I th you know, what comes up for me when you say all of that is just how, how messy life is. Yeah, it, yeah. You know, we, ha we have all these ideas of how life is going to be. And man, I look at, I look at my last 10 years and m mistakes I thought were the mistakes of other people that I then went and made 10 times worse. Um, things that, you know, traps I fell into that I just, if you'd have asked me 10 years before that, will you ever fall into that trap? I'd be like, what are you talking about? That's not me. You know, it's, Life is just really, really messy. And um, I, I think we have to get good at giving ourselves compassion and forgiveness and moving on from things that with hindsight and with, you know, more tools, more resources, uh, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the, the presence of, a, of, 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 of an Instagram video you just watched that now has clarified something for you. It, yeah. You think, yeah. oh, I would never do, I, I can't believe I did that or I, can't, I was so stupid. I was so, and I've, I've done that in one form or another my whole life. You know, I've, I've, I, I, my, when I think of what's been my biggest burden, it has been self-judgment. It has been constantly, relentlessly beating myself up for the, the mistakes of the past and, or the, or, the, or the mistake this morning and not being able to make peace with it, not being able to understand that the person who did that and everyone else can think like this too, you know, the version of you that got into that relationship, the version mm -hmm. of you that stayed in that relationship for, for 10 years longer than you think you should have now that you're out of it, um, you know, the the version of you that made that decision, it was a different version of you. It wasn't you today. It, it was an earlier mm -hmm. model. Yeah, uh, that's a good point and, too. Yeah. And, and you didn't, of, of course you made the decision you did. You know, you were working with the, the tools, the DNA, the influences, the mentors or the lack of mentors that you had then. That was, you were doing, I, I, I think our best can be tragic. I think our best can be terrible, but our best is what we're doing. And mm. that, you know, five years ago when you decided to get into that relationship, you know, or 20 years ago when you embarked on that marriage with a narcissistic person that just ended and you're looking back and going, where did my life go? How did I give up? 20 years of my life to this person. And, and of course, things like that create so much self-hatred. I've thrown away my life. I've thrown away, uh, you know, all of those years that I could have mm -hmm. been doing something else. I've now got to pick up the pieces of, you know, people people make decisions that, that bring utter chaos and devastation into their lives, or they, or they align themselves with a person that brings devastation into their lives. And, and I think, one of our big regrets sometimes is how bad things have to get for us to do anything about it. You know, we, we go, did I really have to let someone destroy my life before I left? Could I not have left before I felt like I had been betrayed a thousand times? Could I not have left before my finances were destroyed? Could I not have left before I put my kids through all of this? Or people, people hate themselves for these things, but yeah. it's, um, life is messy and, and, and what we have it was now never not it was never not gonna be it was never not gonna be messy yeah sorry finish never. your thought Didn't mean to cut no you. never and 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 it's i sometimes think that the the desire for a clean slate is just another act of ego it's just another mm, it, wow, it's just yeah it, once again we're looking for that purity that fresh start and there is there is no fresh start there none of us had a fresh start when we were born let alone now 30 40 50 70 years in we were born to parents who inevitably were going to pass on a bunch of stuff to us and we're going to do the same if we have kids or whoever we end up influencing no one truly gets a fresh start so mm -hmm. it, we kind of I, I really believe we have to 
sit with where we are now in our lives and just go into this complete acceptance of what's our what's my starting point now it's a mess it was always going to be a mess i was never going to get a fresh start so instead of wishing for a fresh start let's just be aggressive about yeah. what does living well or differently or more expansively or more kindly look like today and that's where yeah. that that to yeah. me is an unbelievably exciting thought when we really connect to it instead of trying to to overcome some perceived deficit of the way we've been doing it so far the thing that i say in this you know because it's kind of a hopeless space you know we're talking about the messiness of love and dreams right now it's like all the ways that <laughs> our, our dreams could fall apart of course it's kind of a doubter it's like oh my gosh but the the hope that i see in just holding all the complexity is like uh, the 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 certainty is that things change. Um, there's no world where things don't continue to change. And the, the thing that I feel like is most heavy in all of these unique spaces, oh, I wanna have kids, I can't have kids. I wanna be married, I can't be married. I, I just lost the person that I love through divorce, through death. Like, what am I to do there? It's like, man, the thing we can count on is change. And the sadness, the grief, the regret that we're holding onto now will also change. Uh, even exactly the positives, right. even the positives we're holding on to now are going to mature and change. There was no world where we were always going to say goodbye to the person we love in death or in the middle of our life, whatever. We're, uh, we're always going to lose contact with our kids, whether it was in death or whatever. It's like, it's the, the process of this entire life. It feels so overwhelming in the smaller scope when we zoom in on this month. It feels like, oh, what, what, what am I doing? But then when we zoom out, this is the human experience of, of gaining something for a moment and then letting it go. And there's those of us who try to be happy by, by claiming everything, all the dreams, all the desires, by reaching out into the world and collecting everything we desire and bringing it as close and trying to maintain and control it as much as we can and, and make it as predictable and make it as consistent and efficient as we can make it. And then there's those of us who can take a moment to almost just like take in a sweet, romantic, flirty moment with a stranger and just to be thankful for that Tuesday night. I was like, oh, that was so sweet. I felt like I was seen in a way, even just in that little exchange that I haven't felt seen in a long time. And that was beautiful in its own sake. Not even just for what it could turn into, not just, well, is this my person, but just, wow, in, in a breakup, in a divorce. Oh, the last five years were hell. And it gave me my kid. Like, oh, I'm so grateful for my daughter, for my son. I wish I didn't have to be with that person. Wish I left them long ago. But look at the beautiful thing that came into my life in the midst of it. The loss was always going to be there. But look at that beautiful thing. Sometimes that's not the given. Like, these beautiful sparks of just meaning and joy are, uh, when we zoom out and hold it in retrospect, it's like, oh, man, what a beautiful thing to be alive. And, of course, the experience is living you know we i think sometimes we have this idea that when we're having a bad experience we're not doing living and when we're when we're having a good one that's when we're living and yeah the 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 we were still when we were in that relationship and it was hell and we were having all these negative experiences we were still we were we were living in that time and it's that's it was just another experience and those experiences can be intensely painful they also can create some of the parts of ourselves that we end up being the most proud of um and and the experience that we've had so far doesn't have to be the only story of our life you know i, I talk in the book about the this uh um these these moments that we experience these deaths in our lives you know whether it's a heartbreak uh, and the ego death of feeling rejected, whether it's a divorce and the death of a promise that we made to each other that we were going to stay together forever. It, it, we experience plenty of these deaths in, in our life. And there's a, there's a moment in Peter Pan where it's, Peter is strewn over a rock and he thinks for a moment it's all over and he's, the rising tide is about to swallow him and 
and he has a moment of fear and then he stands up and he says to die will be an awfully big adventure mm. and that line always gave me goosebumps every time whether the reading of that book which for anyone who's read that book was an intensely emotional book for adults um mm. but there's a that moment where he says to die will be an awfully big adventure can be applied in in all of life you know there, there's these moments in life where we experience a death and and our question is what's the adventure that comes out of that when we think that there's a a person we have lost that we can't you know so many people i speak to have lost the, a person who they thought was the love of their life and this person has decided they they don't want to be with them anymore or they've left them in a marriage or they've cheated on them and and left them for somebody else or they, they're going through these difficult deaths in their life a death of a relationship a death of this dream of being with somebody now it's not that that isn't sad or tragic or awful it's not that it doesn't need to be grieved it does but if we're not careful we will start to believe that that's the that was the great story of our life mm, yeah, and and yeah. and that's the dangerous part is we we can all we all relate to watching movies that make us cry that every time we watch that movie it makes us cry but we turn that movie off and then we go live the rest of our lives. It's not, we realize, oh, that was a movie. That was a, a something I engaged with for a couple of hours. And I believe that we can do the same thing with some of the most difficult things in our life. We can engage with the grief of it. But if we engage with the grief to the exclusion of our present moment and our future, we neglect the new stories that are available to us whose beginnings can be located precisely where our feet are now. Ah. We never see them and we never experience them because we're constantly yeah. grieving and, and sitting in the old story as if that's the only narrative of our life. Mm. Oh, that's so good. You know, I was just even thinking, Matthew, it's like being a therapist was not my plan A. And I'm <laughs> so thankful. I wanted to be a preacher. I wanted to be a pastor, and that was that would have been a great dream, and I'm sure I would have been uh, doing just fine in that. But it, you know, my path led me over to being a therapist, and I'm so grateful. Like, there's no part of me right now that's like, ah, I should go back to the other thing, because I'm like, I, I'm. It's so meaningful and soulful of joy here, and then I just I think about other things, like, um, you know, even just I have two kids. I, I have a I have a three year old and a, and a one and a half year old. And to be honest, I think having kids wasn't something I was like particularly, I don't know, it wasn't on my bucket list in my 20s. I was just like, ah, oh, maybe one day, whatever. And then it became really important to my wife and I was like, okay, yeah, sure, let's have kids. But it wasn't exactly like my dream, let's say. I don't know if it, I would say it wasn't my plan A. I, I, I don't know, it, it was what it was. But it then- It wasn't something, you, you didn't feel connected to the excitement of it necessarily yeah, ahead of time. That's a great way to describe it. That's exactly it. And then I got into the experience and I'm like, oh my gosh. This should have, th this is certainly plan A material. Like, like this is incredible. <laughs> like, obviously, like it's, I don't, I'm not always the best judge of what should be the plan A. I think was what I realized was like, maybe life has a plan that is beckoning me. And I have my opinions over what should be plan A and plan B and plan C. And if I rigidly hold on to my picture of what plan A should be, I might miss out on the adventure of my life. And just there's like a, what you're saying, like you're smiling, what's coming up? No, for you? there's a there's a there's a, a British poet um, and writer, David White, who wrote a book of essays, another great book, uh, Consolations, um, that mm. I would encourage everyone to read. He takes these words that have lost their meaning through overuse, and he reimbues them with a sense of poetry and meaning. And oh, he, cool, cool. He took the word ambition for the first chapter. And he had this line when he described ambition. He, he said, ambition is frozen desire. And oh, wow. it's such a profound line because what he was getting at is this idea that we take these desires we have and then we concretize them. Mm. And within them, our prospect for happiness and what we think is going to make us happy. And it, it is 
it lacks humility. It has no, mm. it has no kind of um, curiosity about all of the ways that life is going to bring us joy and meaning that have nothing to do with the things that we decide to be ambitious about, whether that's a career or having children or a certain relationship or moving to a certain country or whatever it is. It's that joy is is what happens along the way uh, in amidst all of those plans that we make. And so I just, uh, that, that idea, I think I would invite everyone to ask what part of my ambition right now is, is frozen desire that really leaves no space for where so much of my joy and my happiness is gonna come from. Yeah. Oh, couldn't put it better in myself. I feel like that, that stamps this conversation in a really beautiful way. Um, this, Frozen desire. I'm gonna write that down. I got chills when you said that. Yeah, what if you're not uh, living in the wreckage of a perfect dream and you have to settle for second best? You're actually right at the mark of the path of a great adventure that is gonna surprise you. And if you have lack of faith that that's even possible, if you're in that hopeless, depressed space, the thing that I hold on to in these moments and I run into them myself plenty is the one thing I can count on in this life is things change. And even the dark, hopeless, discouraged wreckage that I'm feeling now will change. It's Thank funny you, you say that. Every, every in the, the back of the book, the, the, in that chapter, Happy Enough, when I give the tools for how we change our relationship with the difficult times in our lives, one of those tools is labeled everything changes. So oh, I, beautiful, it's, that we, beautiful. it's kind of a nice full circle moment. We said we had some uh, shared DNA here. I, yeah. I, I think... Um, I encourage anyone who's in your audience who feels this conversation was in any way valuable or healing, I think you'll get a lot out of this um, book. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope you'll, if, if you're in Matthias's audience, thank you for yeah. listening. And, and, and if, you, uh, if you do get the book, let me know what you think, because I'd love to hear about it. And, and for anyone, by the way, who does want to know more about it, um, you can get the book. It's available. Um, I think we're releasing this around the time that the book is available um, yeah, or yeah. just before. So um, it's at lovelifebook.com. And we also have an event that I'm doing on the 4th of May, um, which is going to take the lessons of the book and bring them to life in a live way, virtually. So wherever you are, you can join. But um, all of the Good. everyone who gets everyone who gets a copy of the book is going to get a ticket to that event for free. And you can find it all at lovelifebook.com. Oh, everybody go get this book. Love life, love Matthew and everything that he's bringing in the world. It's, um, I've gotten to crack it. I'm a, I'm a few chapters in and I'm just, again, impressed with the, the not settling for cheap answers, not avoiding the messiness. I think you've probably heard that in this conversation. There isn't a, we're not shying away from the reality that there's a lot of hardship in this whole path to finding love and building a love life. And Matthew, I think you're doing justice. And I think you're really helping thousands, you know, tens of thousands, however many people around the world um, really move towards the things in life that are meaningful, the relationships that their hearts desire. I, I respect you and really love your work. Thank you for having a meeting with me in this conversation. It was great. Thanks for having Matthias. I uh, I look forward to doing the same with our audience sometime. You got to come yeah. and speak to our uh, Good. all of the people.